Welcome to the New Economy Forum. Thank you. Which, of course, I'll remind everyone, is going to India next year. Minister, India has a ways to go before it can compete on, in all of those arenas. What's the strategy? Our design capabilities, our ability to look at very complex problems and solve them, our ability to have a talent pool which can be basically deployed in any major technological stuff. These are certain advantages which we think will hold us very strong going forward. So I'll give you a few examples too. First is, let's take the case of semiconductors. Now, we started on the semiconductor journey just about three and a half years back. Today, we already have an ecosystem developing just in three, three and a half years where production of chips is starting, design of some of the most complex chips is now happening in India, all the way up to two nanometers. I'll give you a second example. Take the case of uh, space. Now, we opened up this sector just about four and a half, five years ago. Within a short time frame, we have about 80 startups working in space technologies. I'll give you one more example. Just about 10 years ago, India had just about 400, 500 startups. Today, we have 190,000 startups. We are among the top three startup ecosystems in the entire world. The entrepreneurial energy, which is one of the foundations of our civilization, was kind of throttled because of the policies since 1950. Those have been released by our Prime Minister Narendra Modi ji. In the last decade, so much simplification has happened, so many of those constraints have been removed, that the entrepreneurial energy is coming forward. And that's what drives technology. Our Prime Minister has always told us that we should strengthen our line we should make our line longer. We should make ourselves more stronger. We should make sure that our capabilities increase rather than trying to reduce somebody else's capabilities. We think that we have made lots of contributions to the human society over last 5,000 years. And we as a civilization will continue to make those contributions. We should be able to strengthen our capabilities further our capabilities going forward. For India, is there such a thing as digital sovereignty, if you like? Digital sovereignty is a point that practically every country today thinks about. Would like to be, have the luxury to think about. More like ability to have control over your own future. Yes. In that sense, uh, in a digital world, there are no boundaries, as we know. Internet doesn't uh, follow the global geographic uh, boundaries. Um, digital sovereignty is definitely important, but our policy has been, our foreign policy, as well as our technology policies of multi-alignment, our policy has been that how do we contribute to the growth of technology and betterment of entire humanity through our contributions. That's the way we think. In a world of, let's call it, weaponized supply chains, and that is the reality today. Where, at the moment, I'm not talking about 2031, but where at the moment does neutrality end and alignment begin? Where do you need to work with at least one of those two other regimes, whether it's semiconductors, artificial intelligence, 5G wireless, or the next... 6G wireless, critical minerals. How do you think about that? Today's supply chains are, I don't think they are in zero one state, right? Multiple players are there, multiple geographies, a small component, a chip which gets manufactured that passes through so many boundaries by the time it gets its final finished shape. So we have to work with so many different countries and so many different partners and that's where the factor of trust comes in. We believe that India is a trusted geography, it's a trusted country, because we believe in IP rights, we believe in developing or rather co-developing solutions, develop the complete 4G and 5G telecom stack with our own proprietary technology, and we have given a level of sophistication which is better than the existing products. 
and that's possible only when we work with so many different partners that's not possible working alone you have to work with partners that's the way technology works in my understanding minister i'd like to ask you about social media as the minister this minister as you can see has a very large portfolio as the minister both for information and broadcasting and also electronics and information technology you are at the nexus aren't you of one of the most important debates in global governance how to regulate social media yeah you have two competing forces you have the need for a harmonious and governable society and you have the need for the freedom of expression how do you balance the two how do you keep algorithms from poisoning democracy it's indeed a very big challenge that all of us are facing my interactions with practically every minister uh, whether it's from tough kind of governments to a very liberal kind of government everybody is worried about the very significant influence that social media is having on the trust between institutions and the citizens that trust is getting absolutely broken because of deep fakes because of synthetic material which is flowing around because of rumors which get amplified at the speed of light so all those things are really really worrying everybody and in my opinion uh, i'm not saying that's the policy of government of india in my opinion social media platforms must start taking responsibility of what they are publishing so that the society at large doesn't get harmed by what they publish they're not doing that of their own free will that's obvious so what approach does india take does it take a more rules based approach does it take a more free market approach so does it take a more state directed approach so we take the approach called techno legal approach such technical problems cannot be solved by mandating something we have to have a combination of technology as well as legal structures where we can govern and i'll give you one example our data protection act we decided to go for a principles based law now we have defined the principles we know that technology evolves every quarter every sometimes every month so under such circumstances you cannot have a very prescriptive kind of law which scuttles uh, innovation we believe in a combination of innovation and regulation where our tilt is more towards innovation so that the good things can come to the society while the harm can be separate and it's a difficult thing but we are very deeply engaged with the industry as well as civil society for getting this right balance the government has been at times willing to issue take down orders and demands for content mediation moderation excuse me um it makes me wonder in your experience whether do you paint all of these social media platforms with the same brush are they all equally challenging or would you differentiate between say youtube extremely popular in india facebook also extremely popular instagram snapchat x do you is there a differentiation between them would you call any of them out as being easier to work with and others as being harder to work with see the point is very simple every company which works in india must follow india's constitution must follow india's laws and as you rightly said some of the platforms have much larger reach compared to some other platforms our request and in fact we have been discussing this with the platforms even at the topmost levels every platform must understand what is the social structure of the country in which they are operating how does a platform react to the circumstances how does it operate in the uh, scenario the diversity that we have in a country that must be respected that must be followed that must be taken into account when they make their community guidelines they make their policies and they operate that is something that social media platforms must understand to be successful otherwise there will be stronger regulations that has to be otherwise uh, society will be uh, disturbed let's return if we may to semiconductors the economics of fabs are daunting 
talking about tens of billions of dollars in capex investment for each facility. Does India have the financial resources to match the subsidy levels that other countries uh, are offering to entice uh, fab development? So that was the question people asked me when we started the semiconductor mission in 22. Um, there was a lot of skepticism at that point of time. But today we have 10 units which are under construction. Three of the units have started pilot production. Actually, three will start commercial production going forward in the first quarter of next year. Um, the progress is very, very fast. Second, the talent pool that we have and the way we are deepening and widening that talent pool, that's something which no other country can match. We have 298 universities in which world's latest semiconductor design tools are available to the students for free and the students are designing chips. We have a facility where they are able to tape it out and test it and validate the chip. Tell me which other country can say that they have 10 universities where students can design and tape out chips, actually manufacture a chip, actually fabricate a chip. So while the fabs may require much more amount than we have allocated at this point of time. The comprehensiveness of our semiconductor program will give us that edge which we need and that will bring us to a level where capital will flow to the place where the right place to absorb that capital is. So we are creating all those conditions by creating the ecosystem, by deepening the talent pool and making sure that the market that we have, as well as the talent that we have, brings the capital automatically to our country. And that's happening. A quick question about talent. Uh, India does not just have 1.4 billion people, but it has an extraordinary educational infrastructure and technology with the IIT system and beyond. Do you worry about the graduates who are still coming out of IIT in software engineering about what their future looks like in a world dominated by AI? The IT industry is definitely going through a major change and uh, such changes have happened in the past also. Uh, I've been interacting with most of the IT industry leaders and most of them have found a couple of methods by which this workforce can be utilized in the new AI world for providing solutions to the industry which are AI native, which are AI based and uh, Yes, it will be a transition which will happen over the next few years. Um, I think the industry is resilient enough to be able to manage that transition. You won't find yourselves in a situation where tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of graduates who thought they were going to have a job face a bleak future. I think India will become one of the biggest suppliers of AI services. That's what the IT industry people are saying. We have an excellent question from the audience here on the subject of AI, Minister. The AI and the digital economy, as you said, really have no borders. How do you balance data sovereignty with an open architecture that itself is open to cross-border collaboration and innovation? How is India charting its own path there? So a good way to manage this situation would be to have trust-based relationships with like-minded economies, with like-minded countries, where the solutions which emerge out of such relationships are win-win solutions. Take the case of our payment system, UPI. Now, UPI has got Japanese patent. Uh, it's now being used in Singapore here. In many other countries, people are evaluating. What we have said is, fine, this is our contribution to the world. We don't want this to be seen as a solution which is offered in a licensed kind of way, in a commercial kind of way. We have given this as an open architecture to any country which wants to adapt, a rich country or a middle-income country or a low-income country. So that approach, which is trust-based and which is win-win solution-based, that works. Do you see India as a user of other countries' 
AI technology or do you see India developing its own AI stack? I think it will be both user as well as developer. Um, see, if you look at the world of AI models, LLMs today, um, there are three different categories. One, large models which are basically chatbots and providing summaries and that kind of stuff. Second, small, very focused models which are used in very specific uh, industries and providing that specific solution. This space is providing lots of opportunities for IT industry, for people who are developing applications, for people who are providing solutions. This is one space which is very important for India. The third is basically the new research which is happening. Um, the phenomenon of providing large compute and keep on training the model to a level that is coming to a level of saturation now. Next innovation will come from some engineering or a mathematical innovation which will once again disrupt the AI model landscape. Question is, are we preparing our people for that? Yes, we are doing that. We have created a common compute facility of 38,000 GPUs which is available to all the researchers, to all students at a price which is uh, less than one dollar compared to two and a half, three dollars in the rich world. And that too in the rich economies it is dominated by certain big tech companies. Here we have equalized the access to technology. Our Prime Minister says that we must democratize technology. So that democratization of technology is what we have done. So that approach has given large number of opportunities to a very large number of uh, researchers and innovators. Some innovation can come out of that approach also. It's clear we all have a lot to learn about India. It's one of the reasons that we're taking the new economy forum to New Delhi next October. Minister, in the meantime, if there's one single misconception above all others that people, not just investors, uh, although they're important, but that the world has about India and specifically its ambitions in technology, what would that misconception be? I would like to take the question to a slightly higher level. Um, people find it difficult to understand why India is growing at 6 to 8% band at such a consistent clip and with moderate uh, inflation, high growth, why India could achieve this kind of very healthy balance whereas many other countries have struggled uh, especially after the COVID pandemic hit. So this framework is based on four pillars. First pillar is investment in infra which is social, digital and uh, physical infra. Second is very big focus on manufacturing and innovation. Third pillar is huge focus on inclusive growth so that the entire society grows up together. And fourth pillar is very high level of simplification. 1,500 laws have been removed from the statute. Hmm. So this very thoughtful, very carefully calibrated approach has given us a situation where we are going to grow, keep growing at 6 to 8% for the next at least 5 to 7 years, I can see very easily, with high growth and moderate inflation. That is what India is going to be for the next many years. So, and that's a situation which every investor would look forward to. A situation where there is a stable policy regime, a lot of simplification happening, good growth and very moderate inflation. So welcome to India for the new economy forum next year. I invite all of you to join us in New Delhi next year. Thank you. Thank you.